joy, 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 heaven, you joy, joy. Well, gosh, you've been around since when did you come to Ananda? I came to Ananda with Fedora and my children in 1974. Okay. So, um, do you want to share anything about just, you know, your life prior to that and how you got to Ananda? Sure, happy okay. to. So, uh, I, I was brought up in a very traditional middle class home, loving parents, three brothers. We moved around the country many times. I lived in probably 10 different states while I was growing up and I learned to adapt quickly to make friends and to find the good parts about everywhere I went. So that was really good for me when I came to Ananda. But before that, um, I was living in Berkeley and so was Fedora. We met on in a, I'm trying to remember now, living, uh, not living wisdom, excuse me. We met at the Berkeley Free U and we were taking a class in wilderness living. And we met each other there and we would go on trips every weekend. So we got to know each other. And then we went to Death Valley for, was supposed to be a few days, but our leader never showed up. And so there were, you know, we were in a, nine of us in one band because people would leave anyway. And uh, so, yeah, we got to know each other really well. And then we went back to Berkeley and after a while we realized we were both very much interested in furthering our spiritual lives. And so we, Badura had been part of TM. I had been part of a spiritual group called Ananda Marga. Mm -hmm. And then we were looking for two years, we looked for community. We knew we wanted community, but we didn't really know what that meant. And then we went to a um, meeting of the ways, which was very popular back then. And uh, there all these beautiful spiritual groups. There must have been over a thousand people, this particular place in San Francisco. And so there was the Sufi leader at that time, Pirvilat Khan. There was Yogi Bhajan. There was Swamiji. There was, I can't remember all of them. We didn't know Swamiji. We had read the autobiography of a yogi. And I always liked this story that there were questions from the audience. One of the questions was, can you meditate and um, smoke dope at the same time? Nobody would answer because they would have lost their whole audience except Swamiji. Huh. And Swamiji said, yes, but you won't get as far. Or words to that effect. And that really touched me. And it was a pattern I saw in Swamiji until he passed. He would always say, yes, you can do that. You know, do you need a guru? No, but you won't get as far. So he always like gave you the option and the highest that you could do with that answer and that question. So then we had went out in the hallway and the two people that were at the Ananda booth were Anandi Cornell and Keshava. Huh. And so we got we met them right away and they had a little slideshow at that time. We had a little slide projector and it showed Ananda, and we were very interested. We had gone to quite a few communities, not at all interested in them. And then we went up to Ananda, and I walked in on the land, and this was home. Another very good illustration of Ananda that I always appreciated was, I was brand new, of course, to these teachings. I was already studying another path, not really deeply, but it was like a stepping stone. And so I was talking to this young man who was there at the time, and I said, I don't know what to do with this because I'm so loyal. And how do I accept another path and, you know, still be loyal to the path that I have? And he said, the gurus all work together to take you to your next steps. And that was it for me. That was perfect. 
and I was able to let go because I wasn't really that involved. It wasn't like I had to tell anybody. It was just sort of a meeting every week. I didn't really know the people that well. I think the guru was in jail in India. So it was, it was, yeah, it was pretty easy to let go, but I still wanted to be sure it was okay. So anyway, we both were very drawn to Ananda, and at that time it was the meditation retreat. And so we decided to come for, well, well, we were there for that weekend, and then we decided to each take a week alone, and so we did. Another fun story I like to tell is Vidura loves the snow, and I love the sun, so, of course, the week I went, it was sunny, and the week he went, it snowed the whole time. <laughs> and so that was in, like, maybe February, March, and then we just decided to move. So it was pretty fast. We had two children, preteens, Dwayne and Melissa, and they seemed to be fine with us moving. There was no trauma around it at all, which was good. And so in June, we came up. They were having a Kriya that night, and we didn't know anything about it, but they thought we were there for that, and so they were very kind to talk to us even though they were going to take Kriya. But that's sort of the way Ananda is. Mm -hmm. We work with guests, we work with our own people, trying to be there where they are, and that's a very important part of Ananda and the spiritual path. Swamiji was fabulous with this. He always, in fact, I'll tell you a story. A couple months later, we went to talk with Swamiji, and I had been told by members of Ananda, because I wanted to have more children, and they would say, no, 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 it's not the time. Swami's trying to build the community, and he's asking people to hold off on having children right now, because we need to build the community. So I went there, but um, I just assumed that's what he would tell me, but he didn't tell me that. He said, you should have your own children because my, I consider them mine, but they're actually Viduras from another marriage, so they're my stepchildren. And he said, no, you should have your own children. So didn't happen, but that's the way he was. Whatever you needed to help in your spiritual growth, not just what you wanted, but what you needed or what he felt you needed. He always tuned into that. It was so beautiful. So um, what's the next question? Well, so that's very interesting. Were there times that Swami advised you something that was different than what you wanted or thought you Oh, had? yes. So what's the difference there? <laughs> tell me some of those things. Well, I tell this story. Um, so... We were living up at the meditation retreat. Vidura was getting to be September, October. We needed a place to live. There was only one house available at the farm. We called it the farm then, not the village. And so Vidura just said, let's, well, let's just buy that house. At that time, you could buy a house. Um, it was $7,000, a full house without a bathroom, but we had a great outhouse. <laughs> And uh, two bedrooms, kitchen, living room, everything, $7,000. So we went to the membership committee, and they said, uh, well, what are you going to do for a living? And we and Vidura said, well, we're going to buy the, the Sheridan's house. And they, first of all, they said, oh, really? It's so expensive. And Vidura had just come from the world. He was 30 years old. He had been working since he was 16. He knew that a house for $7,000 was not expensive, even back then. So anyway, we ended up buying the house. It eventually burned down in the fire of the fire of 76, mm -hmm. but this was 74 and we lived in, it was a lovely house. Um, and then I had to get a job. So Badura was still working a lot outside, but he would come back often to the village. And so, Vidura said to me one day, he said, you know, there's this job opportunity down at the farm. Maybe you could do it. So I came down to the farm and I met with this man named Shiva, who was a great soul. He worked with Banai, who you all, most of you know. And uh, it was a job 
uh, working as a staff in the macrame department. And back then, those of you who are my age, remember that the uh, plant hangers were made out of macrame and you could get all these different kinds. So I found, found Shiva, he said, no problem, you've got a job. So I worked there and I loved it. And I would get all the little um, parts of the plant holders together in a bag. And we would, it was a great job actually, because we gave them to mostly to the mothers in the community. So they could go home and take this and make it and bring it back and we would pay them by the hour or the piece, I can't remember which. And I loved it, it was great. And so then I got a call, I was like September, I got a call in March from Seva. And Seva said, um, we need someone to run the, the print shop and we were thinking it would be good for you to do it. I said, no, thank you. I'm <laughs> really liking my job. You try not to say that these days, but back then, what did I know? I was just telling him what I felt. So she didn't say anything much. And then uh, about a few days later, I got a call from Seba again. At that time, there was only one phone at the village and one phone up at Publications. So she called on what we called the red phone. And she said, you know, Swami thinks it's a really good idea. And I said, uh, well, you know, I'm just not interested. <laughs> so she didn't say anything. But I got off the phone. I started getting nervous. So I went and talked to Benai, and he didn't say anything because he knew he wasn't about to give me advice. I had to figure it out myself. So I went home, and I meditated, and I was crying. I didn't want to do this job. I didn't know how to do that job, and I loved it the job I had for one, re not for one reason, but one of the things I loved was I had a house on the hill. I had to walk to work every day and it, there were no paved roads and it was summer and it was hot. And the, the roads were about this thick with this most beautiful dust. It was like, it was like, like flour. It was that consistency. And I would just walk barefooted and it was, I just loved it. And then I would go into my job and I could talk to people and whatever. So I knew at that point, I'd only been here maybe six months, but I knew at that point that it must be a test of some kind, but was it a test for me to stand up for what I thought was right for me? Or was the test just going along with what I was being asked to do? And you know, nowadays we have thousands of classes on attitude, on stress, on how to deal with it. Or if your spiritual teacher feels strongly about something, you know, what, how do you take that? How do you take it in and meditate? And it was very new to me, the whole thing. But I broke on going to the print shop, which was probably the right thing to do. But it was it was a really hard job. I had never worked in a print shop. I had never worked as a manager anywhere. I didn't know what I was doing, but it, you know, it, that wasn't the point of me working there. It was the point of trying to start with the spiritual path in one of the many ways that you, your attitude is right and you have to learn it. And with all these people saying, Seva saying nothing, Benai saying nothing, Shiva saying nothing, it had to be from me. And I really did not like that job, except the only thing I remember that was just a blessing forever is printing. We had a Gestetner at that point, a little Gestetner. And then we had a huge printer in the back, but I wasn't responsible for that. We had this little cassette and it was like a mimeograph machine and we would print almost everything on that machine for the village. But Swami's books were always printed somewhere, you know, on the big machine or somewhere else. But one year, I believe it was 1975 Christmas, um, Swamiji wanted to give 
stories of Mukunda as a gift to the community. He always would give a book or something he had um, created as a Christmas present for everyone in the village. That year it was stories of Mukunda, but they couldn't print it in time for Christmas. So he asked me if I would print it on the Gestetner, on this little mimeograph. And so, of course, I said, yes, I will print it. And we, it actually came out pretty well. My daughter and I stayed up till wee hours of the morning on Christmas morning, printing that, getting it done. And then the nuns and the people that worked in the other part of what is now Hansa, but was then the publications building, they collated it and they uh, uh, printed, uh, well, we printed the cover. It was this real pretty blue and they bound it with blue electrical tape. So this was, do you have a copy of that? I don't. Okay. So, I mean, it was a treasure. And so Melissa and I did that and then Swami gave it away. So I'll finish. This is sort of a fun story around that. So um, then the fire happened that June. And so everything we had burned up. We didn't have anything left except a fork, one fork I found. And, uh, and so we lost it, but we lost everything. So about five years ago, I said to Seva, I lost that book and I really remember how important that was to me. And she said, okay, I'll give you mine because the nuns and monks did not lose their homes. And so she gave me hers, copy. But I didn't feel right about keeping it, so I gave it back to her. And so last Christmas, I believe it was, Catherine, wa we were doing a Christmas fair or something. And there was a, Catherine had all these tables of archives. And so I was going through looking at it and there was stories of Mukunda in this little blue. And I, I said, oh, do you want to hear the story about stories of Mukunda? She said, sure. So I told her the story and she said, oh, now, Seva had passed away last Christmas. She had just passed away. So, so Catherine said, oh, just a minute. She went up to her car and she brought back that same copy of Seva's because she had kept all the books of Seva's that were inscribed by Swamiji. Hmm. So she said, here, this is yours. Makes me cry. Hmm. So now I have it again and it's Seva's to Seva with a beautiful tribute from Swami. Mm -hmm. So you never know what things are going to happen, but at Ananda, mm -hmm. nothing is for nothing. It always means something, and you have to look inside and find it. The people here that do that have grown into saints. Mm -hmm. There are so many of them at Ananda, and they just keep getting better and everybody has their own path within this path so you can be the best made meditator and you can go deep or you can have a real struggle with meditation but you are excellent serving people loving people being kind to people so when you see so many different ways to experience and express this path, you know that there's no one right way mm -hmm. and you appreciate everybody and what they can do because you know everyone's doing their best. Mm -hmm. So Swamiji set us an amazing example and he would say to me sometimes, because I was in charge of membership and all those things at one point, he would say, find the gift everyone has to give and work with them on that. Mm -hmm. And so I did that as best that I could while we were village managers, general managers. We had these different roles. I was in charge of the events and membership and housing and all those things helped me to appreciate people. In the beginning, I remember um, working with uh, membership and I had written up this four or five page, what does it mean to be a member of Ananda? And I had written that up and it was helping me when I would work with people. And one day during the lawsuit, it was very, very difficult. Um, it was just 
People were scared. People didn't know what to think of what was going on. And they would come in and, you know, it's just trying to work with people. But what really helped, oh, and I always wanted everyone to be a, a NANDA member. So in the beginning, I would say, oh, you don't have to do that. Or, oh, that's a little bit difficult. Why don't you do this? And it wasn't always right to do that until I remembered, oh, everybody doesn't belong at Ananda. Everybody doesn't want to be at Ananda. You have to be strong in what you're guiding them to be. And I remember one time, Swamiji, there was a woman in the community who decided to uh, take another guru, a beautiful soul, a very good friend of mine. And she was getting negative. And Swamiji, we knew, because I was part of being with him and some decisions, and he would say, you know, I think it's time for her to go. And so Davy said, well, would you like me to talk to her? He said, no, I want Durga to do it. So that's what he would do. He would give you something, okay, this is one of your dearest, not dearest friends, but a close friend. And I, I, she was beautiful soul, but she didn't belong here anymore. So I got to take that uh, little pamphlet that I had made, and I went over to her and I said, who's your guru, you know, are you, you know, are you contributing to Ananda in a positive way? And I was just able to go down there and she saw immediately that it was time. We were both crying, um, it was hard, but it wasn't personal anymore. It was, um, here's what it means to be an Ananda member. And after that, Swamiji wrote the guidelines and all that, but in the beginning, we didn't have those. So, Working with him was so inspiring. Um, he had to, you know, I think with, well, may, maybe not everyone, but with people that were going to become leaders or were leaders at that time, he had to call you on things, you know. you He had to train you. I remember Asha saying to me one time, I'm always interested in Swam who Swami wants around him because I know they're going to be leaders because they need to find out from him uh, certain things about themselves. And so Vidura and I did, and it was just such a joy to be with him. He was also funny. I remember one time having dinner with him somewhere, and there was a nice white tablecloth. You might have had this experience with him too. And he, there was, he, we had uh, rolls, and you know, you break open a roll and these little crumbs get on the white tablecloth. And he would take this spoon and he would pop the crumbs across the table. He would just do that. You know, like that story of, of when Master tried to get the, the fork, I think it was a knife into the glass. And he finally got it in the glass and it broke. And he said, but I got it in. That was what Swamiji was like that. He had such a sense of humor and... So much love for everyone. Um, he was just there for you in good times and bad. And I remember one time I was very sad about something. We were living in his, in his apartment because he was living in, in uh, Italy at the time. It was during the lawsuits. He wanted someone in his apartment to live there. So we moved down there and lived there for about a year. And I was going through something. And he said, Durga, the tests never end until you're self-realized. And so they're, they get a little bit harder. As you become stronger, they become stronger until you know you're just okay. And then it's almost like there's no test because you've accepted everything that comes to you. That helped me so much in that situation and other situations. Always remember, oh, I must be getting stronger because this is really hard to deal with. But you would, and you'd come out the other end. And um, I was going to tell you, do you want me to tell you a fun story? Of course. Okay, so here's another fun story. So we lived in his apartment for a year. He was gone. And usually when he'd go to India or Italy or anywhere, he would come back every, um, he'd come back every few months. But he hadn't been coming back. I said to Vidura one day, I said, do you think he's not coming back because we're living in his house? He said, I don't know, why don't you call him? So we called him up. He was in Italy, and 
we were talking to him and we, you know, thanked him for being there and blah, 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 blah. And we said, Swamiji, are you not coming back because we're in your house? Oh, no, we, I love having you there and da, 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 da. And I said, Swamiji, you haven't been here for a year. Are you sure? Well, I'll talk to some people here and I'll get back to you. So one hour later, he called and he said, I'll be there in a week. So... <laughs> In one week, we had to move. We had moved all his furniture out, and it was all over the community. People were, and all our furniture was in there. Maria Warner was the head of housing, and she called and said, "I've got a house for you." And I said, "Are you sure?" I told oh, and Swami. Oh, one of the things Swami said was, well, "You don't even have a place to live." And I said, oh, no, Maria just called. And he said, oh, I'm not sure that'll work for you. And I said, Swami, it's really nice. It's this house. Wow. I said, it's just fine. And he said, so I'll call you in, a, in an hour. So he did. I'm going to be there in a week. So we had to move. No, first we had to find all his furniture. They wanted to shampoo the rugs. They wanted to paint the whole apartment. And, and then move out our furniture the person who was living in this house, which is where we moved to, still hadn't moved out. We had to get him out. He was moving anyway, so we weren't pushing him out. And all that happened in a week. He was there in a week. Everything was done. Now, that's community at its finest. <laughs> it was just a joy. Uh, we laughed a lot, and we were hoping we'd get done in time, but of course we did, and he came. Great. So that was fun. Do you have any other questions? I have a question. Just you've described so many beautiful instances of just saying yes mm -hmm. and the growth that comes from that. And I'm just a question might come up for folks. You know, are there any cases where it's appropriate it's for you to say no, that it's for your own spiritual growth that for your own benefit? I can imagine that you could try it and just find out the result and mm -hmm. be honest about it. Mm -hmm. But should you always say yes or how, how does that go? I don't, th I don't think so. I think you have to meditate and really pull on Swamiji and Master, what do you want me to do? Because I know sometimes uh, people have said no. And he Oh, I'll tell you one time I said no. So I was um, working in the schools. And Kalyani and I worked in this tiny little office. And I was pretty much needed there uh, on the school staff um, to create a balance, whatever that was. And I felt I really needed to be there. Swami called me one day and said, I need a manager for Earth Song. Would you like to do that? And I said, Swamiji, I'm willing to, but I really think... I need to be here for the schools. And he said, fine, that was it. Never asked me again, found someone else to do it. I think um, there are times, and a lot of times, whether it's Swamiji or other managers, they're just calling to see if it's okay. And they don't have an agenda that you should do it or not do it. They're just finding out who could be the best in that job. And so I think just to be as honest as you can, sometimes it's no, I just can't do it. I'm not ready to do it. I, you know, whatever it is for you, why you are saying no, you also have to be real honest with the person and with yourself and not be afraid of what the answer is. Mm -hmm. And I think for me with the print shop, I just didn't want to do it. I mean, I was so happy, but I knew somehow I knew in my heart that I needed to say yes. And this was before I knew anything about say yes to life or anything. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so. Can you share other cases of how you grew from experiences at Ananda or opportunities that were asked of you or anything that occurs mm -hmm. to you? Well, one day we were in India and we were with Devi Mukherjee, who was very ill. And we were sitting on Master's bed in his house in, in Kolkata. And that house at that time 
was not so great. It was moldy. The kitchen was leaking. The roof was leaking. Um, it was very and in deeply inspiring because Master had lived there for almost a year. But on the physical level, it wasn't so great. Swami called. We were with Davy sitting on the bed. He said, "Would you, would you two be?" okay about living in the house after Davy dies. Oh my gosh, we went through all kinds of gyrations about it, you know. For me, for Vertira, I don't think it would have been, the physical wouldn't have been a problem. But for me, it was, but we said yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, we'll say, let's see what happens. And then it turned out that Hashi, who was still alive then, was gonna go and live with her son and that's why Swamiji wanted someone in that house for various reasons that I won't go into. But she decided to stay in the house. So it just took it, you know, it took it away from us. We never had to deal with that. Mm -hmm. So that was, um, yeah, Master took that out of our hands. We mm -hmm. didn't have to do it. But we wanted to do it. We wanted to do it because we were so close to Davy and Hashi. We wanted to do it because that house is so deeply inspiring. Um, and just to please Swami, if he's asking us to do that, he knew we loved India. We had taken tw 20 tours to, to India with pilgrims. So we were very familiar with the city and with that house and Master's house, which is right around the corner. Uh, we knew the family. So there were a lot of reasons that it would that of reasons he would ask us to do that. I'm just so impressed with how loving you are with people, how much you care about people. And, you know, just uh, I'd like to know more about that quality or just has that always been there? And how do you like to express that at Ananda? I was just born that way, I think. Um, when Swamiji gave me my name, which was about maybe nine months after we moved. We moved here in June, then following Easter, I had already asked him for a name, but um, I was at the meditation retreat, which is where all the Sunday services took place. <clears throat> and I was standing on the common dome deck. For some reason, I guess I, I self, what do you say, self gave myself the, the role of greeting Swami when he came. What I remember, and I very rarely did he come alone, but what I remember is him just coming right up to me alone. No one else was there. And he said, I have your name. I said, what is it? And he told me. And I said, what does it mean? And he said, well, usually when I give names, I like to uh, give one thing that you already have and one thing to strive for. And in my case, it was generosity and non-attachment. And I knew immediately which was which. <laughs> and so I ran in the temple, and Lakshmi was one of my best friends. And I, she was sitting way up in front, sitting on the floor. I went up to her, and I said, I got my name. She said, what is it? I said, Druga. <laughs> I'd never heard of Durga. <laughs> she said, I don't think that's the, your name. I think it's Durga. And I said, yeah, it's Durga. What does, you know, and so she enlightened me. But I've always had that quality. I love people. In fact, when we moved down to L.A. with Swamiji, I can't remember the year, but he gathered us and Jyotish and Devi and Sean had just written him a letter asking him to move to L.A., and he, he obviously was very uh, moved by that letter. It was a very long letter, as I remember. He read it to us. And then he sort of went around. Jyotish and Devi, you can teach uh, the Raja Yoga. And I think he said us both. Durga and Vidura, because you like people. So that was just a quality that we had. It wasn't... I was trying to be like that. It was just something that came in. And I really do love people. And I love making... There's nothing happier for me than to um, just make somebody happy. Usually I do it through gifts or 
whatever. But it just, mm -hmm. I, I can't say that I developed it or maybe I did develop it further. I think people are just born with some mm -hmm. qualities that are going to help them in the I would say to people, somebody mentioned it at a Sunday service. I said, you know, you don't have to thank me for being generous. You don't have to thank me for being nice. But someday you're going to thank me for being not attached. <laughs> That's when it's going to really mean something. So what, I'm still... What, what have you learned about non-attachment? Well, I'm learning that's a very important quality. To be happy, you can't hold on to anything. You have to just accept what life gives you, um, what Swami gives you, what Ananda gives you. Um, you have to accept. When you can accept, you can be happy all the time. It's when you, there's these little niggly things like, I don't want to do that. Then that causes friction, that causes sadness. Um, yeah, so I think I've gotten way better. I've lost a house. Everything came back. Um, didn't have to worry about it a bit, a bit, and now we're in fire season again, and I'm thinking, okay, what do I have to save? Because everything that is in my house are antiques. They were my mother, my grandmother. I love everything, and I already let it go if it has to go. So you learn through experiences, and I know if this house goes, I'm going to be just fine. So... Do you do that thing of that Swami suggested of every night? Yes. Not every night, but I do it when I'm thinking I'm attached. And then I have a funny story about that too. So Swamiji says every night before you go to bed, give everything back to God, cut the cords that bind, all those things. So he was telling us in, in a class one time that he had told people that in this class. And then this woman called him and said, Swamiji, you told us to give everything, and now I've lost my house. He said, I didn't tell you to, to give your house like that. It's the attachment to the house I told you to give up. So you have to be very careful when you do things, when you give things up. But the main thing, love God and appreciate everything he gives you and sends to you. And just try to love what he would say is, I love everybody. So that's one of my goals is to love everybody no matter hmm. where they're coming from, where they're going, all the mistakes that they make and I make. Um, that's no judgment. Just accept and you're much happier inside.